Um, and this is this event's part of the Spirit in Place Festival. I'm sure a lot of people are here because of that, but there's people here um, that have found out in other ways as well. The Spirit in Place is supported by the Lilly Endowment, the Margo and Robert Eccles Fund, uh, CICF Fund, the Allen Whitehall Clues, or Clues Charitable Foundation, Bolson Group, the Polis Center, and IPUI. Um, and our event sponsored um, and supported by uh, the Indiana Humanities um, in partnership with the Indiana Stores Society. And, there's some folks from uh, and also, um, like to thank Thomas uh, or Tom and um, Susan Hoback. I thought I saw Hoback. Yes. Um, and so there, um, it was kind of interesting how it sparked um, this. This event was uh, a meeting between um, Tom and Andy Olson, who's one of the presenters here, around his work with the Treaty of St. Mary's, which is um, 200 years ago, in which that was signed. And so Andy's been doing a series of articles for the Indian Historical uh, Magazine Connections um, and around the, the treaty. So if you guys have a chance, um, pick up a copy of that. So as I mentioned, you know, the, this is the 200th anniversary of the, the signing of the Treaty of St. Mary's. Um, and I think that you know, a lot of times there's uh, around centennials or bicentennials sort of marking some of these events that there's celebration. Um, and I don't look at this as more of a, of a celebration. I look at it as more of a um, reflection about the past and how, do we, how does this treaty and treaties in general um, inform how we think about the past, not only the past, but the present. Um, and how are those still an important part of, of our relationship to this place? And how do we, how do we further understand that as both native and non-native um, people in this place today? Um, and sort of the, the, the title of this is Crossroads of Nations. So I think Indiana's state model is Crossroads of America. But long before Indiana was Indiana, long before the United States was the United States, um, all of the indigenous nations were here. Um, and this has always been a crossroads of, of various native nations. Um, you know, I think, I think we're, we, we were talking as we, uh, before we came in here about, you know, we're all anxious to kind of learn from each other. Um, about these various histories as well. You know, we have some understanding from our own perspective, but it's also, it's always very interesting to hear it from, from different perspectives. Um, I think a lot of people think of treaties as being these sort of dusty documents that don't mean anything anymore. Um, and I hope that we can change some of, uh, or impact some of the ways in which you, you think of the treaties. And then think about how that has changed um, for you to reflect upon how that has changed, how you think about a treaty at the end. Um, so before that, I wanted to just talk a little bit about sort of the bare basics of treaties. You know, it's this coming together of different nations when you think of the treaty. Um, and so it's the, an agreement between two sovereigns, or one or more sovereigns. I like this quote from um, David Wilkins, who's a political science uh, professor um, at the University of Minnesota and, you know, getting people to think that Native peoples are nations. Um, I think a lot of people think of it in terms much more of kind of racial, ethnic identities, but we're, we're citizens of our nations um, and we're always treated as nations by Europeans and then once the United States came into being, they carried on that, um, that uh, tradition of signing treaties. Um, and that this establishes this nation-nation um, relationship. The other idea is I think that Native people have special rights that were given to us by treaties, um, and that's not the case there. Because our rights pre-exist the Constitution, um, that those treaties reserve those pre-existing rights. Um, they exist outside the Constitution. But the U.S. Constitution upholds the treaty shall be the supreme law of the land. So they, so the Constitution says that these rights are, um, are protected. Um, and so I think those are, those are some things to think about when you think about treaties and think about um, of sort of that, that these are still um, very much uh, a part of how tribes deal with the federal government today and our nation of nation relationship, that that still continues. My topic here is to just give you an idea of the extent of the treaties that were done here in the Midwest and a little bit 
about how they came to be. Uh, but the story of the, the tree situation here in the Midwest really starts back with our Confederation Congress that predated our Constitutional Congress. And one of the final things that they did back in 1787 was to sign the Northwest Ordinance. And the reason that's important in this context is by this Northwest Ordinance, the United States government set up the criteria by which territories could become states by meeting certain thresholds of population and other things that were associated with that. And then they would also be guaranteed property rights, long-lasting, irrevocable property rights that were part of what would, was going to come out of this process of statehood. But as you can imagine, with this occurring, uh, there was an issue as it related to those that actually occupied this land before. So in conjunction with the articles that I've written uh, for the Connections magazine, uh, I worked along with another to create this map to show the general location of tribal groups here in, in the area that's encompassed by the Northwest Territory, approximately 1800. Uh, as you can see, the tribal groups occupied uh, a significant amount of the Northwest Territory. So uh, there was obviously a conflict or a difference of viewpoint as to how these lands should be handled as the United States had effectively invited the pioneers to come and settle in this area because of these uh, provisions made in the, in the Northwest Ordinance. Um, here, there were, there were two indigenous tribal groups that really considered this their homeland, the Miamis and the Potawatomis. Because there were so many different bands or groupings, there was not just a single tribal leader. So as you can notice by the map as well, where their tribal towns were located, or the villages were located, at about 1810 or so, this representing the Potawatomi, the symbol, and the Miami represented here. Now you'll notice I didn't include the Delawares as part of the dominant uh, nations at that point, because the Delawares happened to have been the, one of the most removed tribal groups in, in the United States history. They were actually physically relocated 14 times. You might wonder why, why this overlap at the hash area that's because in certain instances, more than one treaty were involved in gaining access to this land because the indigenous people did not have defined boundaries like we would have. They were often sharing land as well. So at various times, the various treaties dealt with the same overlapping lands. So after the treaties of 1818 and all the other ones that had come, this is what the state of Indiana looked like at the time that the uh, Indiana became a state in 1816. In 1818, the first treaty that was signed was the renegotiation of the 1817 treaty that had to do with Ohio. So St. Mary's is located in Ohio. It's kind of halfway between Fort Wayne and Richmond, but just over the state line. And the reason that St. Mary's was chosen was because it was within the Indian Territory, and there was a belief that it would be, be a, easier to control the whites providing liquor and trying to sell liquor into the tribal groups that were located there, and much more easy to manage the situation. So, what happened in this treaty? You can see just the magnitude of what, what was involved here. In a set, there was a set of six treaties that were involved with eight tribal groups. So the first one that's shown up here is the one, is the renegotiation of the treaties of, Saint, uh, of Fort Mix in the year before. And then there was a swap of 5,000 acres from one part of Michigan here in the Detroit area to another. That was done just a couple of days later. Then there was one with the Potawatomis and the Weas that was done shortly thereafter. This involved this area 88 over here, which it's, it's interesting in the documents 
by the treaty commissioners, they kind of said there was virtually nothing that the Potawatomi were giving up in this treaty. When I went to look at it in more specific detail, I somehow think that, that was more than nothing, substantial. So because the Delawares were on land that was the hunting ground area of the Miamis, there was, a, together, it was really something that the Delawares and Miamis did together. So you can see the areas that were involved here was this for the Potawatomis and this entire purple area here going into Ohio a bit. In addition to that other area that we saw, that all came under the U.S. government control as a result of this series of treaties in 1818. So just one other slide, one other thing to make mention of. There was also another strategy. I mean, part of what was done here is even though the United States gained access to this large area, what they did was they basically uh, held back certain lands and said to the various Indian groups, either in terms of the tribal groups or individuals, you could have retained some of the land that otherwise would have been given to the United States. The most important thing to understand about reserves, however, is that there was an intent on the part of the United States government to make sure these reserves were not adjacent to one another, with the idea being that over time, while they would have rights to these lands, they would ultimately find themselves so isolated that they would kind of be induced to treat the land back to the United States. And that's exactly what happened over time. But there were at least two tribal leaders that became very good at what, what has been characterized generally as adaptive resistance. Uh, and that was the Pohagan's uh, chief and Peshua, who was Richardville as well. They were able ultimately to gain unrestricted title to land, much of it in fee simple. And so this concept of adaptive, adaptive resistance became an a, a, a important aspect of those groups that were able to remain back here in the Midwest. And I'll read it. To the Indians, the reservation will be an evident disadvantage. They will promote neither their civilization nor their comfort, and in half a century will probably occasion their total extinction. The object of civilizing the Indians is a pretty theme for the speculative philanthropists, but sober conclusions may be drawn from a little personal observation than the theory of closet disclaimers. Thank you very much. I just said hello. It's good to see all of you here this evening. My name is Diane Hunter, and I am a citizen of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. And I am honored to serve my nation as Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. What I'd like to do this evening is to talk a little bit about our history, the history of the Miami people, and also about the treaties from our perspective as we see um, the treaties and as we saw them at the time. Mitane, Miamiake, Nipangonje, Sakechewecheke. At first, the Miamis came out of the water. That's the first line of our oldest story. It's the story of our beginning, our emergence as a Miami people. And that happened on what is today the St. Joseph River, uh, somewhere between Lake Michigan and what is today uh, the South Bend, Indiana. And we came out and we established a village, uh, the coming out place, the place where we came out. And that was our beginning. And from there, we developed other villages. We moved out of that place into many other places. Each of these dots there are villages, um, many along the Wabashikisipiwi, the Wabash River. Um, but these are only a few of our, our better known villages. We have many, many other villages, primarily in northern and western Indiana. But Miami people have been in Indiana since time immemorial. This is our homeland. This is where we have always been. 
And um, one of the really big changes, though, that came was the Treaty of Paris. The treaty that ended the American Revolutionary War. Now, before that, we had the French and the British in our land. This land here, Nyanyongi, the land of the Miami, this is what we saw as our land. But in the Treaty of Paris, the British transferred their claim to the Americans, which the Americans seemed to understand as this was now their land. We didn't quite see it that way. And this was our land, and they were invading our land, and they were kind of encroaching on our land, and so it was war. We went into a period of, of war with the Mishimak Sake, the big knives, the Americans. You know, we've been fighting these battles, and we've won this decisive victory, and then here they came back with more men and, and fought against us again, and we began to realize they keep getting more people. There are always more men to fight for them, and our numbers are not increasing. In fact, they're diminishing, and we can't continue to fight. And so the best thing to do is to have a, an agreement that we won't fight anymore. And so the first treaty was then, as has been mentioned already, the Treaty of Greenville. And then with the Treaty of Greenville, those great out areas were the lands that we lost in the Treaty of Greenville. And this was the first land that we lost, um, the first treaty that we had with the Americans. So in 1805, this is what we had. 1809, this is what we've given up. And if you know, remember, just two years ago, we had the bicentennial, 1816, Indiana is the state. And that, at the bottom there, is what was Indiana at that time, because the rest of it was still our land. It was still not ceded land. Then the Treaty of 1826, we gave up the lands north and west of the Wabash River, and so we had just these little spots of land. 1828, 1834, 1838. All we have left is the Great Miami Reserve. Now, in addition to these lands, these are the lands that the tribe had. Um, individuals in these trees had been given lands as well. So there were individual reserves. But I've only shown you here the tribal reserves. And so this Great Miami Reserve was all we had. In the Treaty of 1840, we agreed to give up these 500,000 acres for a land that was supposed to be of about the same size in Kansas. So we would give up all our lands in Indiana in exchange for land in Kansas, and we agreed to be removed. But we didn't really think that we would have to go. We had plans about how we could avoid being removed. We could stay here. Some of those private lands, there were enough privately owned lands by this time that we could all fit on that land and we could all stay. But uh, it didn't work out that way. So, in 1846, the U.S. Army came to Peru, right there around Peru. They came to our villages and they rounded us up. And at Peru, they put us on canal boats. And then we went to Fort Wayne and they put us on some more canal boats. So we come all the way along here. And then from Kansas City, we walked. 50 miles south to Sugar Creek in Kansas. Now, if you notice this date right here, we arrived in Sugar Creek on November 3rd. So this was 172 years and two days ago that we arrived in our new lands in Kansas. It was a very difficult winter for us, living in government issue tents. But after we got through that winter, we started making Kansas our new home. We built houses, we grew cornfields, we grew gardens. This was our new home. And then about 20 some years later, after the Civil War, 
And then she said, you know what? This is good land. This is good farmland. We want it. We want it back. And so we were removed again, this time to northeastern Oklahoma. And that is where our tribe is headquartered today. So this history and these treaties are important to me in the work that I do as Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. I should kind of clarify, why is a Tribal Historic Preservation Officer? Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act um, allows for state historic preservation officers and for federally recognized tribes, we also can have a tribal historic preservation officer. And in a nutshell, my job is to preserve and protect sites of historic and cultural importance to the Miami tribe. And what I do is, anytime there's a federal undertaking, meaning there's a project that the federal government is involved in where they're going to disturb the ground, I, as the, representing my tribe, as representing the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, I have the right to consult on that project. And this is, as, as Scott mentioned earlier, this is government to government consultation. This only occurs with federally recognized tribes because the United States recognizes federally recognized tribes as sovereign nations. Now if you think back to those treaties, okay, so treaties are an agreement between two sovereign nations. So in making treaties with us, the United States was recognizing that the Miami tribe is a sovereign nation. And if we were a sovereign nation and they made a treaty with us for us to cede our lands to them, they were also implicitly acknowledging that they were invading our land when they first came and fought with us. Our ancestors' signatures on these treaties help identify lands that are of historic and cultural importance. Um, so where those treaties were are areas where I need to consult um, on federal projects. Now, my areas of consultation extend beyond those treaty areas um, to the areas where we had been removed and also to areas we had been in before um, the treaty era. So, but the treaties are a valuable tool that I can use to say, yes, we were here, this was our land that we ceded to the United States. Those treaties identify not only the ceded lands, but also the reserved lands. Lands that were reserved to the tribe, lands that were reserved to villages, and lands that were reserved to individuals. And the description of these lands in the treaties can help us understand what areas we need to focus on as we look to what needs to be preserved of our history. The treaties provided for annual payments to the tribe that was to be distributed to individuals. The reason for these annuities is that in ceding our land, we were also ceding our means of supporting ourselves, our areas where we had always hunted and fished, our land where we had grown our cornfields. Without that land, we had no means of supporting ourselves. And so the annuity payments were to make up for that. And because the loss was permanent, we would never have that ability to, to um, grow our own corn and to hunt and fish in the same way we always had. The annuity payments were intended to be in perpetuity as well. Now that didn't happen. They, they did call it an intervention to the annuities, but that was the original intent. The treaties also provided for the construction of, of some homes for a farm animal, for farm animals. And so these treaties in those ways also help us understand how we live and what was important to us as a people. And there were some treaties that did provide for hunting and fishing rights that on the ceded lands. So truly
treaties were instruments by which we gave up our lands. But today, those treaty documents are evidence of our history. And even more significantly, they are evidence of our ongoing tribal sovereignty. Michigan, thank you. I'd like to start by just thanking the Island Drawer Museum for, for hosting this event, for inviting us all out to, to, present, to present our pers different perspectives, our different tribal perspectives on, on treaties. Um, I'd also like to begin by saying I'm, I'm not a tribal member, um, I'm not a non-native, um, I'm an anthropologist, and I began working with the Delaware tribe in 2001, and I've been their historic preservation officer. Um, I'm the counterpart to Diane, and I want to thank Diane for explaining that. Um, I'm also a, an anthropology professor at Emporia State University, which is a small university in eastern Kansas. I've learned an awful lot, um, a lot more than I can present here in, um, to, tonight from my work with the Delaware tribe. Um, one of the first things I want to just explain about the Delawares and why the Delawares are not indigenous to Indiana. Um, the Delawares were actually removed, were one of the first tribes to experience removal. Um, the Delaware homeland exists along the Delaware River and the Hudson River um, in the states of New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. Um, the, as I said, the Delawares have experienced removal um, for an awful long time. Their removal is very different from the type of removal that we, we're used to hearing about when we think of the Trail of Tears. Many tribes like the Delawares and the Miamis and the Potawatomis experienced removal in a very different way. Um, the removal that, that tribes in the Northeast experienced was a much more sporadic removal, um, and it was periodic. It wasn't one big removal, and, and oftentimes along the way, the tribes broke apart and moved to different locations. And so today, the Delaware tribe, who I work for, is one of six Delaware tribes, three of which are federally recognized tribes in the United States, the Stockbridge Muncie in Wisconsin, and then there's two tribes in Kansas, the Delaware tribe in Bartlesville, the Delaware Nation in Anadarko, and then there's three groups in Canada as well, of First Nations in Canada. In terms of treaty experience, the Delawares, um, what's unique to the Delaware experience is that the Delaware, um, like many Northeastern groups, engaged in colonial treaties. Prior to the, the practice of signing treaties between European nations and Indian tribes, um, many Northeastern groups exchanged wampum belts um, using the diplo indigenous diplomacy to broker deals, and that indigenous diplomacy predated the, the, the signing of treaties. But um, the Delawares were signed treaties for, uh, with, the, with the English. I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of, of, of a dozen treaties were signed between the Delawares and Delawares and the English. The practice of signing treaties with the United States began with a treaty with the Delawares in 1778. Um, during the Revolutionary War, um, the United States signed a treaty, an alliance treaty with the Delaware tribe, and as part of that exchange for alliance, if the Delawares allied with the United States, the United States would create an Indian state um, that would be led by, led by the Delaware. And Ohio, incidentally, was envisioned as that first, as that first Indian state during this, during this treaty. When you hear the term Indian territory, it begins with this treaty. Um, if you think of a pre-statehood experience is the territorial experience. Tribes moved to places that were Indian territory or were moved to places that were Indian territory because they were envisioned to one day be an Indian state. Um, that dream, that, um, that idea ended in 1907 with Oklahoma statehood, which was the last, last Indian territory. Um, since that time, the Delawares have signed uh, 23 treaties between 1778 and 1866. Um, here's a list of all the treaties that the Delawares were party to. Um, most of these treaties uh, involved land sessions or, di or diminishments. Um, these treaties, a land session would mean that the Delawares would um, exchange their lands in exchange for, for lands further west or additional lands somewhere else. Um, or the Delawares would agree to a diminishment of their reservation, as Diane showed well, um, the Miamis did as well, the, the eventual diminishment of their lands 
Um, but most of these treaties dealt with those uh, with those types of land sessions or diminishments. Um, the last treaty signed with, with the Delaware in 1866 was the treaty that um, led to the final removal um, from Kansas to Oklahoma. And after 1854 and the Kansas-Nebraska Act, when Kansas and Nebraska were um, organized to become a state, many of the tribes like the Delawares and the Miamis um, and the Potawatomi Potawa groups, um, some of which were moved um, into Indian territory, what eventually became Oklahoma. So we're going to see this map an awful lot. A lot of those treaties, I'll just, what I'll add to this is that a lot of those treaties that were signed between 1778 and 1866 dealt with uh, the cession of lands in the, in the Northwest Territory, in Ohio and Indiana, in terms, of, in terms of the Delaware experience, it was in Ohio and Indiana. Um, the Delawares were part of the Treaty of Greenville, as we've heard mentioned. Um, there were other smaller treaties. Uh, there was a small community of Delawares in Goshen, Ohio, um, that signed a treaty to move to, to cede their lands and move to Kansas. And then also, of course, the, the Treaty of St. Mary's. The Delawares were um, a part of that treaty as well. Even though the Delawares signed those large portions of land in Indiana, the, Delaware, the nucleus of the Delaware settlements was actually along the White River. Um, essentially between um, Indianapolis and Muncie. These villages were often along major rivers and the confluence of major rivers. You can see that here. Um, however, even though they were called Delaware villages, um, these villages were never just Delaware. Delaware, Shawnees, Miamis, Potawatomis lived together in the same communities um, on the frontier. And so oftentimes that's why a, a one treaty is not just with one group in Ohio and Indiana, but it's with uh, several groups because they're all using the same, the same territory. I'd like to point out also though this strategy of living together continued throughout the removal of Indian people from the Northwest Territory. Um, and it continues today in Oklahoma. And so here you have what Delaware country looks like today right before statehood. There were these settlements that existed along the major rivers and streams. Um, these settlements were followed the same frontier structure where they were multi-ethnic, multi-tribal, and multi-racial in, in, in many cases. Yet they were referred to as Delaware. So if you were to ask somebody from Oklahoma today, where's Delaware country, they'll tell you exactly where it is, but it's not on the map. If you ask them where's Hogshooter the Hogshire community, they, they can tell you, but it's not on a map because these communities um, um, dissipated with allotment and the uh, uh, land loss that came with allotment in Oklahoma State, but, but there's still a legacy of those communities that continue today. As, as the Historic Preservation Officer, uh, we use these treaties to identify, help identify our areas of interest. Um, it didn't show up very well here, but what you're actually looking at <laughs> is a map of the United States. And each one of those things that you can see colored in is a county where our areas of interest lie. And these areas of interest are based on trees and they're based on areas of known former occupations. And this is my job, as Diane pointed out, our job in our office is to manage the impact to historic resources in those, in those regions. What you're seeing is the Northeast, this is Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Kansas, or Missouri, Kansas, and Oklahoma. I'd also like to end with just saying that while the Delaware tribe was moved to Oklahoma, um, Delaware tribal members, although concentrated in Oklahoma, this is a map showing where the counties in which Delaware tribal members live today. And the red and the yellows indicate area counties that have higher population areas. The blue is um, the blue is showing um, lower population areas. And as you can see, there's Delawares that live in all 48 states. Actually, there's Delawares that live in all 50 states. It's just Alaska and Hawaii won't fit on them on my slide here. Um, so they live in all 50 states. You can see there's most concentration in Oklahoma. Um, Kansas and Texas, um, California, which is just a, a product of the Dust Bowl experience in, in Oklahoma and the migration of Delaware people to California. Um, but Delaware people have, have not only moved out west, but they've returned 
back to their homeland areas even after the after the removal. Um, but part of that return includes 39 tribal members that live here in the state of Indiana, and it also includes the expansion of our his historic preservation office. The tribal historic preservation offices for the Delaware tribe are located in at Emporia, Kansas, and East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. So we have two offices and we partner with local universities in those homeland areas to establish offices. And we, we use those offices to not only support our work, but also to train students in doing this kind of, in doing this kind of work for, this historic preservation work for Indian tribes. Thank you. Well, uh, bonjour, Jayak. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, John Lau, Jashmin Kass. My name is John Lau. Nijmika, how are you? Mishke Meknek Bilgem, I'm Turtle Clan. Okegnek Bodwadmi Anishinaabe. I'm a citizen of Okegan Band Potawatomis, and I'm a human being. And thank you for having me here today. But thank you very much. I wanted to thank the Idle Jury for having us all here. I wanted to thank my uh, fellow uh, uh, discussants uh, for a lot of knowledge that they've given me. Indianapolis, Indiana, right? Kind of ironic. The city of Indians in the state of Indiana in the state of Indians. But they moved this almost all, all of us out, right? It was an ethnic cleansing. It was an uh, um, ethnic removal uh, that doesn't get talked about enough. But uh, this is our ancestral lands. This is our homelands. This is my holy land. Now, many of you have holy land somewhere else, maybe across another sea. Um, mine is on the St. Joseph River. It is important uh, for us. So, thinking about uh, treaties, so there are agreements uh, between peoples and in the European context of the Western idea, between <coughs> nations, between sovereign governments. So as other uh, folks have already said, there's a recognition there when you enter into a treaty that you're recognizing that these are not just ethnic groups or cultural groups or cultural affinity groups or racial groups. Uh, these are sovereign nations. So when the United States was entering into treaties with Indian peoples, they were recognizing us as individual sovereign nations. That's important. It was an idea that we had to come to grips with because uh, you know, a lot of us uh, Algonquian Indians in the Great Lakes region were much more uh, organized around clan affinity, clan identity, than national identity. On Turtle Clan, I might have had uh, a closer relationship with and more responsibility and obligation to a Turtle Clan Miami person than a Bear Clan Potawatomi person. A Turtle Clan Menominee person may have been a closer relative than a Eagle Clan uh, Potawatomi person. But, the Europeans and then the United States didn't want to deal with this like that. They didn't like that strong interconnection of webbing of social fabric that was almost indestructible. They had to get away from that. So they had to make us pretend to be nations, identify like them as nations, and treat you with them like nations. And so these treaties started off as treaties of alliance treaties of peace, treaties of trade. So we entered into these treaties because we wanted those things too. But then they became treaties of loss, treaties of session, taking, removal. And by then, uh, the juggernaut, we couldn't stop it, right? We couldn't stop it. So a lot of it became adaptive uh, survival. The general business is surveillance, active strategies of uh, uh, making it. You've heard about the uh, Treaty of Greenville, 1795, um, after the Battle of Fallen Timbers. How do I we were there? Treaty of Greenville, 1795, we were there. Um, at Prophetstown, 1812, we were there. Uh, Fort Dearborn, we were there. Um, and there were a lot of treaties made. We had 
in, in people's fleet who had uh, multiple claims to a similar territory, right? And there's enough space and enough resources that nobody get uh, uh, too bent out of shape, usually, certainly not in this area of the country, the Great Lakes, the uh, Midwest. And so you've seen maps of other uh, uh, tribal nations, their claims. This is Potawatomi, what we claim as our traditional homelands. I uh, remember um, always hearing uh, teachers laughing when I was uh, a youngster. Uh, when we, if, you know, on the one day of the year that we ever talked about Indians, and then usually because I, I grew up in Niles, Michigan, uh, so that's the, you know, the epicenter of Potawatomi uh, homelands, um, certainly the Pokagan Band. Was the, uh, there'd always be this sort of smirk about, you know, the Potawatomi signed the most treaties of any Indian nation. Something like over 200 treaties that we were signatories to, various Potawatomi peoples. And uh, that was because they would give anybody's land away for anything, you know. So this, this uh, like we were doing something that's honorable. Like we were giving away something that wasn't ours. Which wasn't in fact the case because I asked my grandma Goldie about this. Grandma Goldie was my Potawatomi grandmother who helped raise me. And as you all know, grandmothers don't lie. <laughs> and so I asked my grandmother Goldie and she said, it's just because we had a lot of land. And they wanted a lot of land. They wanted a lot of land. And so they took it. That's why we signed so many treaties. So, um, treaty I was going to focus on, um, take you to the 1830s, is uh, Leopold Pokagan, is the uh, patriarch of our band. And uh, so we had in 1830 the Indian Removal Act passed by Congress, right? Ethnic cleansing. Remove all the Indians east of the Mississippi to the west of the Mississippi. And then 1832 Black Hawks War, dispute with the Meskwaki Fox um, Indians. So by 1833, it was, it was clear to the non-native peoples of Chicago area that the Indians couldn't stay. And that included the Potawatomi. We had to go. We had to go. So that was their decision. I, in my classes, I, I get tired of calling white people white people, because white, what's white, um, or settlers or settler colonists. Or, so I came up with pets, people of European descent, which means what is the Mayflower? The first Pez dispenser. <laughs> so, that's as good as my class. <laughs> and you saw the high point of the semester right there. Uh, anyway, so the Pens decided 1833, September 1833, told all the Potawatomi gathered in Chicago, we're going to enter a treaty for the last of the land and your removal. Well, you might say to yourself, well, why does anybody go to these parties? They sound like they suck, you know. Um, good point. Well, they would say, well, if you don't come, we'll find somebody to sign the treaties. Don't worry, we'll find somebody that will claim, we'll find somebody who will claim to be a leader of your community, and you can either negotiate your, you know, it's like some used car lot deal, right? You know, negotiate your best deal, but that's it, because you're leaving, you're going and we're taking the land. And that's just how it is. Leopold Pokagan, and in the 1820s, converted to Catholicism. And uh, went to a uh, diocese in Detroit, and uh, got uh, a priest sent. And uh, so, uh, a bunch of people, we were one of the many villages, there was Wissau's village, uh, uh, other people's, uh, people's villages along the St. Joseph River in southwest Michigan, northwest Indiana. So his village, uh, which I grew up across the river from, so we, we moved about a mile in 170 years. Um, but, uh, so we were Catholic. So that uh, became important during the negotiations 
that were called for in September of 1833. The treaty commissioner said, come and make your best deal because we're taking the last of it and you're all going. Leopold Pokagan was a teetotaler and he stayed away from the rest of the Indians as the whiskey barrels were being rolled in, right? And uh, so uh, they negotiated the best deal, the, all the various groups of uh, the Illinois Potawatomi, the Wisconsin Potawatomi, the Indiana Potawatomi, all these various groups were negotiating their best deals. And so the deed was done. The next day, Fulkagan came back to the treaty commissioners and said, we need an addendum because we don't want to be removed. And we shouldn't be removed because we're Christian. And they thought about it and they said, okay, we'll have an addendum. Because of your creed, you don't have to be removed. They had planned to send us further north uh, in Michigan, um, but they never got around to that, so we avoided removal. We had an exception uh, because of our creed. The other Potawatomi, after they got their um, gifts and the documents were signed, they, they went back home. Went up to Wisconsin, went to Canada, went to back to Illinois, Indiana. Then the removals started, 1838. And so we have a trail of death where the Indian and the Illinois Potawatomi are gathered up and uh, shuffled off um, to uh, lands west, ultimately uh, Kansas and then Oklahoma for some of them. Other Potawatomi fled to northern Wisconsin and stayed up there. Uh, others fled to uh, Canada, some fled to Mexico. But my people stayed where they were at. And I realized that this was a difficult choice because we had to do a lot of uh, acclimating. But it was important to us that we stay in the ancestral lands, that we stay on lands where we can claim proudly that we walk on the bones of our ancestors, that we stay where our ancestors are buried and we tend to those graves. Right? It was important that we do that. We made no judgment about the people that went west. Some of them went west for pretty good reasons. They thought well, they had no choice. Some of them, others did have a choice, and they left to get away from the pets, right? The further west, the better. Uh, that's uh, the annuity payments and uh, uh, that was uh, made. I uh, can report that we were talking uh, about the fairness or the unfairness of annuity payments. I did get paid finally in 1891 for a treaty from the 1860s, I believe. For my share of Michigan, I got $1,000. Bought me a used Ford. <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, but in the end, uh, we've survived. And we're federally recognized. We had to uh, uh, work to get that federal recognition restored back to us. That was successfully. We're a community now of 5,000 people. Uh, we have uh, economic growth, population growth. We have uh, preschool. We have language revitalization, cultural revitalizations. Uh, we have uh, health care. We have elder housing. We have a strong, functioning, proud tribal nation. And a lot of that starts with that Treaty of 1833, because that's when we started calling ourselves the Pokagon Potawatomi. Because before that, we are just the Anishinaabe, the human beings. We are just the human beings, just like the rest of us, just the rest of you, right? But after that, they'd say, well, if you're not with Pokagon's band, you got to move, you got to walk. It's amazing how quickly people caught on to the idea. Yeah, I'm with Pokagon. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, you know, not come to think of it, I'm okay. I'm okay in vain. Yeah, and so we still smile about that. Those 12 villages converged into one, right? And uh, so uh, we uh, celebrate the fact that uh, our ancestors had the wisdom to figure out a way that we could remain Indian, remain uh, true to uh, the values of our ancestors, and remain true to the hopes of the future seven generations. So thank you for having me.